Hello there, hello there. Welcome back to the random. No, welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show. Not random show today. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with I, your host, Agostino Zinger, and this is episode number seven five nine. Siete cinco nueve of the Agostino Zinger show with I, your illustrious and all right host, Agostino Zinger. I hope you're doing well wherever this lovely, 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 lovely podcast may find you. I hope you're doing swimmingly. I hope you're doing well. How am I? All good, all things considered. I honestly cannot complain. All good, all things considered. The football's back on tomorrow. Normal Premier League club football resumes tomorrow a bunch of matches are on i'm just happy international week is over i saw in my life i didn't watch a single minute i didn't watch a single minute of international football i saw some goals but i didn't watch a single minute of international football and i think maybe i'm the same as other fans i think when i was perusing on the timeline i don't think i saw a bunch of people on the timeline talking about international football the way i did in previous months Maybe a lot of people are like myself. You just kind of watch the football or the international football, at least when it's like a big international tournament, but you're not exactly watching the fucking friendlies and the European qualifiers for this or whatever. Who gives a fuck? When the main thing comes on, that's when most of us, myself included, actually tune in to watch. But the other stuff, not that interested, not that interested in the slightest. But um, big up everybody else that did check it out. Hopefully you had some fun. Hopefully you enjoyed what you saw. But for me so far, meh, not really for me. Didn't really enjoy it. Don't really bloody, bloody care. So I'm really looking forward to all the big lineup of the flipping football this weekend. This weekend, I've got a bit of a jam-packed one because I'm actually DJing for the first time in a bloody long time. I'm going to be playing at the lovely Heathcote and Star, um, which is a little pub that I usually play at from time to time. It should be a good occasion. I'm going to be a bit risque this time around because usually I take the safe route when I play those type of gigs and I kind of play what, you know, people in there would expect me to play. You know, it's a pub where people are basically eating burgers and chips and I'm in the corner playing my heart out like I'm on the stage at Bergheim. So it's not exactly the most illustrious club gig in the world, but, you know, you, you take what you're given, right? I'm in these little small rooms. I'm doing a fucking... um. You know, I'm doing one of these small rooms where you kind of got to earn your stripes. You kind of got to, you know, come at it the right way. So I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Um, So that should be pretty decent to kind of go and establish and have fun with. My approach going forward with this is that I'm going to approach it. I've done this before in the past, but sometimes it's easier said than done. Because sometimes you get a bit nervous when you're there and you're worried not to make a bad impression. But this time around, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to play at Labatee's this Saturday, the same way I'd play if I was playing at some massive venue somewhere. That's what I'm going to do. It's absolutely crazy, but I'm going to approach it the same way as if I was playing at Fold, as if I was playing at fucking Bergheim, if I was playing at Pamela's, Robert Johnson, Smart Bar, The Bunker. Right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to approach it like a massive kick, so I'm going to go in there and just start absolutely destroying, start for the really heavy set super hard and fast techno and just see what the patrons over there say see how the people re- see how they react to it and again please picture the scene it's a regular pub where they sell like burgers onion rings fries uh <laughs> hot wings <laughs> i'm gonna be in the corner absolutely going crazy it's gonna be so fucking fun i really can't wait so even though i want to watch a bunch of football I can't really watch a bunch of football because I have to be preparing my things, you know, getting my set together and shit. But I'm really um, eager and excited to go. I'm not going to lie. Um, you know, I even had a chance, which haven't happened in a long time, to even design a flyer, right? I haven't designed a flyer in fucking ages. And I got a chance to do one the other day um, because it's the first time I've played in a while. So that should be fun. So that was kind of fun, you know, to open up the old flipping um, Photoshop again and put together a little, um, what you call it? a little PSD file for my little flipping thing going on. So that should be pretty much a good one. But yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'm not going to lie. It's been a while. Um, Most likely the equipment's going to be horrendous. That's one of the bad things about playing at my level. The places that I play at, the equipment is always trash, right? The equipment is always trash. And again, I'm not that person to blame the equipment, but I'm telling you now, the equipment is always flipping trash. 
always trash. So I'm gonna be playing on decks where like one CDJ, the 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 tempo gauge might not work. One CDJ, the play button might not work. So you just have to figure it out. So it's gonna be pretty interesting to see what bit of the equipment doesn't work too well. Usually it's the mixer. So I'm thinking actually, what I might do going forward, I might actually try and buy the most basic standard or entry level Pioneer mixer. I'm sure they exist. Let me see how much they actually are. I don't know how much these things are, but I want to try and get like an entry level Pioneer DGA mixer, right? I'm sure there's like a 400 or something I can buy that's like a two channel mixer. And I might just start having that at home. And then when I play these little club gigs, I'll take them with me. It's a bit insane, to be honest, to buy a mix, to buy a fucking small two channel mixer just to take with you when you're going out to play. But I probably need it considering some of these pubs I go to literally the mixers have been covered in beer juice, maybe bodily fluids, um, cum, right? Loads of weird stuff is covering all these places. So I probably might need to go and purchase like a basic entry level mixer. Let's say um, from what I can see online here, there's a DJM 250. That's like 350, maybe something like that. Right. Maybe, a, maybe a DJM. Let's see if I can find, let's see, let's do Pioneer. Let's do Pioneer. DJ AM 200. Dude, let's see what a 200 goes for. So there's that. Um, let's see if we got a DJ M2. Okay, let's, let's do 250 then. Maybe the 250 is the one I actually need. It's a, I just want a little mixer. So I know at least if the decks aren't working, I've got a decent mixer I can use. That's going to be okay. Do you know what I mean? That's probably what I probably need to do going forward. I'm not going to lie. Um, I'm kind of, kind of, you know, gearing towards that side of doing things. I think that probably might be the only way to kind of make sure. Let's see, let's see if they got it at West End DJ. This is one of my favorite shops to go and buy all this stuff from. The West End DJ got a DJ. Yeah, they do. Cool. So West End DJ do have the Pioneer mixer that I need. That's one of the premier, um, you know, DJ equipment shops here in London. So they've got this thing that I want. So most likely I'll probably end up buying this sort of thing, which is funny because the gig that I'm playing in this pub, they're paying me £150. So I'm going to be taking a mixer with me that's probably worth more than the equipment they have there. And it's definitely worth more than what I'm getting paid. <laughs> that's the level that I'm at. That's the level that I'm at. I'm going to be taking a mixer with me one day. That's going to be worth more than the equipment they have in there. And it's worth more than what they're paying me. <laughs> that's the life of a fucking, what you call it? Um, What, what would I call myself? An amateur DJ, I guess. Not even an up and coming one, an amateur DJ. That's the life of an amateur DJ. You go to these clubs and you start playing on the shit. You, you have to actually bring your own equipment, bring your own mic stand, bring your own microphone. <laughs> uh, to be fair, I'm, I'm sure those people do exist. I'm sure there's people out there, stand up comedians probably, or people that do open mics. You probably bring their own microphones, right? I'm sure that it does exist. Guys who do like open mics probably bring their own amp, probably bring their own, you know, obviously guitar, equipment, whatever musical instrument. And I wouldn't be surprised if maybe they, if they don't bring their mic, they at least bring their own um, pop shield. Because the last thing you want is to catch like, you know, syphilis or something, putting your lips on some microphone that every single person's been sucking on when they're trying to be, when they, when they try to sing fucking Sweet Caroline at fucking 9 p.m. at night on a Sunday. Do you know what I mean? So that probably makes more sense. So that's what I'm probably going to end up doing. Regardless, I'm really looking forward to it. Honestly, it's been a while since I've played in front of a, you know, in front of strangers, basically. Most of the time I'm stuck in, in pirate studios streaming to, you know, you, you guys over the internet, which is good. But still, you need to have that kind of tactile, you know, relationship with randoms. I'm not really going to look forward to the request because unfortunately, again, at my level, you get a bunch of people coming up to you at the DJ booth saying, hey, can you please play Rihanna? Can you please play Beyonce? Can you play? So the request thing is always annoying, but, you know, I deal with it and kind of bat it away with grace. Sometimes as well, the annoying thing about the requesting, as great as it can be for people to ask you for songs, it can sometimes feel like they're judging your current play, your current playlist. Like, hey, what you're playing now is terrible. Can you switch it to something that I want to hear? Do you know what I mean? Or I can do your job better than you. Hey, here's a, here's a suggestion. So it's never really the nicest thing you can say to somebody. I understand why people say it, don't get me wrong, but it's just like, God damn it. And I think for me personally, just think, talking about this over, just talking about this now, and thinking about it, you know what would really work in the UK that would kind of solve a lot of our issues? For some reason, we don't really have a good jukebox culture in the UK. It's not a thing in pubs. Pubs usually just have a playlist or they have like a PA, a PA system behind the bar where they just have a laptop plugged in to some speakers and they'll just play some Spotify shit. But I think 
pubs in the UK could benefit a lot from a good jukebox, you know, with some classics on there, you know, standard fucking pub music for mums and dads and people in between so that people could feel like, I don't know, they could somehow, you know, soundtrack the night and you could also take away, so you could put back control, obviously soundtrack the night and also it takes away the pressure on people requesting songs from whoever's DJing and shit on Pacific nights. I think for most nights, Monday to fucking Thursday or Sunday to Thursday, I think having a jukebox in a corner at most pubs would really fucking help to just kind of change the mood. And I wonder really in general why most pubs don't have it. I'm sure there's a reason for it. I'm sure there's a reason why a lot of landlords in the UK don't want to have a, you know, a jukebox in a corner. But I think a jukebox would really help to kind of just, you know, spruce up the mood in London. But also, to be fair, we do have quite strict rules around noise pollution. There's always annoying neighbours. Gentrification is a big issue in London. So maybe the reason why they don't have a jukebox is because, you know, local neighbours would complain and shit. And it'll probably turn a pub that's pretty chill into a place that's quite rambunctious if people realise there's a jukebox you can use up until the fucking, you know, the pub closes. I don't really know. Either way, I think if I was going to have a pub, that's the first thing that I would have. I'd have a banging jukebox. I'd change the stuff there, you know, every couple of, you know, weeks or something. I'd have some staples, but I'll change it in terms of every couple of weeks and have some kind of banging stuff on there and kind of go from there. That's what I'd personally do. But again, what do I know? What do I, blood clot, know? Absolutely nothing. And apart from DJing, I'm also looking to go out to on Saturday night. And one of the nights I'm looking out to go is to Budokai. Budokai is happening on the Saturday. Well, this is going to be from 11 to 6 a.m. on the 30th of March featuring um, Elia Kula, Lucia Lu, Tekara, someone called GRMCK and the founder of Budokai, Samantha Togni. Looking forward to this. Should be fun. Um, not been to a Budokai in a long time. I think the last one I must have went to might have been. What the last one I went to? Might have been like E1. If it wasn't E1, it may have been... I don't know. It doesn't matter where it was, but it's been a while since I've been to fucking Budokai. So I'm looking forward to going to that. And tickets aren't too highly priced either. Final release, only 1850 plus 220 um booking fee. So basically 20 quid. And most likely that allows you to go there just before it closes at 3 a.m. Um the blurb here says renowned queer platform and party Budokai brings Eli Akula, Lucia Lua, Takara German care to fold for a dark, sexy, sweaty night of techno and club. Um, Berlin based Ilya Kuli is renowned for her blistering blend of techno rave and breakbeat electro and jungle so you already know what the vibes are going to be in there um, as an intrinsic part of the Spandu 20 her robust um, robust oh big up DSP robust expansive knowledge of all the things techno means we're in for a treat on March Lucia Lu is a Berlin based DJ as well Tekara is a name from Fold um, is renowned that Fold as a DJ who moves from strength to strength I've not really heard who Tekara is I guess it's a UK person and another person, GR, is a DJ and footwear designer who knows her way around the raw dark tech. Now, having played sets at, oh, Hotbox as well. Big up Hotbox. Big up uh, Becky Strook. Duh, 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 duh. So, looking forward to that. Should be fun. Nice one to go to. Nice, cool, uh, you know, Flinter Plus LGBTQ community there. So, you know, it'll be cunty. You know, it'll be sexy. You know, it'll be turnt. So, Weekend is absolutely locked and loaded for me. Absolutely locked and loaded para me absolutely locked and loaded para me so oddly enough oddly enough world shocking news has just come across my flipping desk right as i've been recording this podcast and i've been doing my thing thinking about things and just you know opening my third eye guess what's happened the most tragic news the most tragic news has happened lizzo unfortunately has quit music According to an Instagram post that she put out just a few minutes ago, Lizzo has quit music. Now, take this with a pinch of salt, right? Because musicians do this all the time. Whenever they're in a bit of a strop, they quit. They want, like, I can't remember the amount of times that, you know, Lil Uzi Vert has threatened to quit music. But considering Lizzo's been fairly quiet the last 18 months in terms of music, in terms of being, you know, public and shit this probably makes a lot of sense and maybe there is some truth to it so let's actually read the caption itself what she posted on the old instagram regarding her quitting music so the caption on instagram says as follows i'm getting tired of putting up with being dragged by everyone in my life on the internet all i want is to make music and make people happy and help the world be a little bit better than how i found it but i'm starting to feel like the world doesn't want me in it 
I'm constantly up against the I'm, I'm oh, sorry I'm constantly up against lies being told about me for clout and views being the butt of the joke every night every single time because of how I look my character being picked apart by people who don't know me and disrespecting my name I didn't sign up for this I quit peace sign obviously with the black skin emoji clearly in it she's definitely somebody that would fucking you know manually change the fucking skin tone of my, by the way if you're a person who fucking changes the skin tone of your emojis on your fucking keyboard you are a weirdo you have issues you have problems to 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 assign some level of personalization to a fucking emoji things that don't actually exist in the real world to represent you is dumb especially because a lot of people tend to i've noticed they tend to put their emoji skin tone a little bit lighter than what they actually look like in real life so if you're going to do the whole skin tone thing, at least make it, you know, closer to what you actually look like. Don't fucking start, you know, bleaching your skin on a fucking emoji skin tone. It's fucking bizarre. Anyway, going back to the statement, I'm not going to lie. It is quite sad that this is happening because unlike some people out there, I'm a big fan of Lizzo's music. I quite like her. I think she's very talented. I think she's a brilliant performer. Um, I think she's got an incredible range. I think she has a really good, really high ceiling when it comes to what she can do, her potential. Obviously, the range is incredible. She can make anything from country to R&B to pop records to disco. Like, she's incredible. But the funny thing is, when I was thinking about her posting this quit statement about music, was you know what I was thinking? I swear one of her most popular tracks in the last few years is titled About That Ti About Damn Time. It's a sick song, right? It's, it's a very, it's a kind of boogie funk record. Something that you could imagine like Stevie Wonder jumping on a fucking remix and fucking making it go crazy. So she's got a track called About Damn Time. That's one of her best tracks. And she's quitting music. And there's a bunch of people I've seen online reacting to it who are saying About That About Damn Time, right? There's somebody actually used this meme here on the side of Jeremy Clarkson, where he goes, oh no. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you know, people are kind of rejoicing the fact that she's quitting. But I'm quite surprised, I'm not going to lie, just off the back of, I feel like Lizzo did amazingly well to overcome counterculture. When those former dancers came for her and attacked her and basically said that she was a horrible leader, she was abusing them, harassing them, pushing them too hard, making them want to drink too much, making them want to do drugs, making them turn up, making them grind on people. Like she sounded like a, a bit of a tyrant, but also a bit of a horn dog, which makes sense considering, you know, she's always outside, you know, showing her tits and bending over and making it fucking shake and shit, right? She's clearly a bit of a freaky, you know, um, out there kind of girl. But I thought she did incredibly well to come back from that. The fact that she was also alleged to be a bit of a bully who ironically fat shamed some people in her fucking dance group and shit. I thought she did really well to come back from that cancellation. And you know what she did amazingly well? She just pretended like it didn't happen. She just steamrolled through it. She just kept turning up to events. She kept going to concerts. I, f I forgot who was performing. Maybe it might, it might have been a Beyonce, um, what you call it, tour. She went to a couple of Beyonce tours. She stepped out. She was dancing. She honestly acted like nothing ever happened and i honestly think that's the best way to deal with those type of like soft cancellations obviously if you've been accused of like grape and assault and all those type of things you can't just step out and, and pretend like nothing's happening and start like you know harlem shaking and shit but if you've got one of those cancellations where it's like somebody just saying oh you're a horrible person or you call them names or whatever you can kind of you know make that shit go away if you just step out and act like nothing happened and I think Lizzo did a good job of that. So in my opinion, doing all of that good work to step out, pretend like cancellation doesn't work, only to then quit music makes no sense. So I have a feeling this has more to do with some stuff happening behind the scenes than some stuff that we've seen in front of camera. Something else is maybe happening that's kind of affecting her ability to enjoy music and put it together. But here's another theory of mine. Reading this whole blurb, it's also making me think, maybe this is all a play to get some attention. Maybe she's feeling like people have forgotten about her. She feels like she's not included in, a, in the public discourse, conversation, in culture. No one's really been paying her any mind for positives or for negatives. And she trotted out a lot of the things that people say about her online in this statement, right? People talking about what she looks like, people criticizing her music. For, like She's kind of saying things in the hopes of goading people into saying things about her. So it kind of feels like this is a bit of a stunt. You know, so either something's happened behind the scenes that we're not aware of, or this is just a stunt to get attention and to kind of put a t to put the limelight back on her 
get people talking about her again because before today I hadn't heard a single person mention Lizzo and I hadn't thought about her ever since she got you know exposed for being a bit of a shitty leader shitty boss shitty friend whatever it may be and maybe not the ally of the body positive positivity body positivity movement as I thought which was funny because I remember reading a couple of tweets online and loads of girls or people who had abbies that look like girls were basically saying that they weren't surprised that Lizzo came across like a bit of a mean girl because essentially a lot of the girls are saying that the meanest girls within mean girl crews or within crews of girls are usually the fat ones and they're usually the meanest to each other so other fat girls are usually more mean to other fat girls than skinny girls are to me are to fat girls which i was like huh that makes a lot of sense so even though Lizzo was purporting to be like body positivity person, which I thought was sick, to be fair. I'm not going to lie. I actually did enjoy the fact that she went out of her way. I forgot what the show was called. I think it was on Amazon. She went out of her way to basically hold these open auditions where she was basically trying to, you know, um, rewrite this or sort of like, you know, change the sort of perception of what it means to be like a backup dancer and not just have it be like, you know, super skinny, super hot looking people like you see at most tours especially at Beyonce's one right where the backup dancers all had you know their own groupies and shit she wanted there to be like a lot of representation um in terms of people what people look like and obviously their size and shit and I thought it was quite refreshing to see that to see girls on stage that all went twinks right they kind of all came in all shapes and sizes but unfortunately from what we saw in the allegations from some of those backup dancers you know it probably it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows it was pretty difficult to kind of make that work now do I believe everything that was coming out of those girls' state out of those girls' mouths? Probably not. But the truth of the matter is, unfortunately for Lizzo, similar to like an Ellen DeGeneres, a lot of Lizzo's brand, apart from the fatness, was based on her being really nice. It was, it was based on her being really warm, really kind, really sweet. So when the story comes out that you're a bit of a meanie, that probably does way more damage to your reputation than the whole like fat shaming thing. The fat shaming thing is kind of whatever. Obviously, it's not nice, but. I think the real damage to her reputation was people finding out that she wasn't a nice person behind the scenes. The same way like Ellen DeGeneres kind of got killed because of that. Because, you know, she purported to be like this happy, smiley person. But then behind the scenes, she's a bit of a tyrant. And obviously, you know, rules a bit of an iron fist. And people are not really the, you know, don't really enjoy working with her and stuff. So that sort of stuff obviously isn't the greatest. Now, in my opinion, just to kind of end this, my current feeling would be, because artists and musicians are starved of attention and they're all narcissists and attention whores and clout hungry, I have a feeling that this statement was an attempt to get people to pay attention to her again. I don't think she has any intention of quitting music. I don't think there's anything else that she could do apart from doing music anyway. Like I said, apart from all her antics and how annoying she could be online, there's no there's no denying that Lizzo is a musically very, very talented, very, very gifted. She probably has more talent in her pinky toe than a lot of mainstream artists out there. It's just in it's just unfortunate that the overall package isn't great, right? She just isn't, you know, she just hasn't got it, which is probably why she's in a situation as she's in now. She's quite, she's kind of like, she's kind of like a fat Normani, if that makes sense. If you know who Normani is, you know what I mean. Lizzo's kind of like a fat Normani. She has all the potential to be a star, but just hasn't got it, you know, hasn't got it, hasn't figured out the whole package thing. So I think this is just a cry for attention. I don't think she has any intention of actually quitting. And I think most likely we'll see her drop something next week. <laughs> That's what I think is going to happen. We'll see her drop a new single next week and it will be forgotten. But, you know, it's a shame that the last song that I remember from her that kind of springs to mind is about damn time. And a bunch of people online are celebrating and saying it's about that time. It's about damn time, sorry, that Lizzo quits. But I don't want her to quit. I want her to stay and make loads of good music. Because like I said, I think she's super, super, super talented. And I want to see more from her going forward forward and on top of that i wanted to make an update regarding the sloan um controversy that happened recently i'm sure most of you guys know that i was speaking about it on the previous podcast that this artist called sloan or how do you say his name ola lusu ola lusu sloan or ola lu is that how you say that how do you say that do you say that ola ola olu ola olu sloan yeah so ola olu sloan this artist had made this artwork called the Free Yoruba Brothers, which features these depiction of gollywogs, and he sold it for a record £31,750. And a lot of people online, especially black people in the UK, were really angry about it because they were upset that the depiction of black people on that painting wasn't the greatest and it's being sold for this much money. It's kind of furthering and cementing black stereotypes and it's racist tropes and blah, 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 blah. You get the drift. 
another part of the community of people online who were complaining were other black artists in the UK who felt as if this guy's artwork wasn't worthy of the attention it was getting and it was upsetting them that they weren't getting the same attention that they were getting so kind of a little bit like a jealousy type of thing right I for one was saying that I think it's okay to say that you don't like the artwork in terms of your you know preference of what you like to see on a canvas but I think to go as far as to say, oh, that should be me, I think that's when it it, it kind of it steps into a territory of not being productive. It steps into a territory of hating for hating's sake. And it also um, just comes across a little bit evil spirited. I think just saying you don't like the artwork is one thing, but saying that should be you or saying that person's undeserving of their success is really extreme, especially when you think, you know, when the reality is that art is incredibly subjective, like most art forms. And, you know, whether you like it or not, it's kind of your preference. But just because this person exists and does something that you don't like doesn't mean that they're not worthy of attention, love, or whatever it may so be. Now, one particular young lady really fucking hates Sloan. And I have to be honest, a part of me kind of rates the hate because she's wearing it on her sleeve and she's saying it boldly. The person I'm talking about is this young lady called the Art Bay, also known as, um, what's her, I think, also, what's her actual name? Her actual name is... Uh, Lindsay Daniela, right? This girl called Lindsay Daliena really, really detests Sloan. And I like that she wears it, you know, on her fucking chest. But I also think this approach isn't constructive and is most likely an explanation as to why maybe she hasn't reached the heady heights that Sloan has reached, despite her thinking her art is better than his. So when this whole tweet went, you know, viral, sh depicting the artwork that Sloan put out and obviously showing the price that it sold for, she quote tweeted it and said, it sucks to create art that I do and constantly get rejected for opportunities. But this minstrel depiction of black people is what the artwork fetishizes and calls contemporary African art. I don't think you can call this contemporary African art. I just think you can call it contemporary art. I think putting the label or kind of, you know, pigeonholing it to African is also a little bit offensive and kind of otherizes us. If it, if it was up to me, being an artist myself, I want our art to exist in the big galleries, in the main, you know, fucking conventions uh, be written about in the main publications you know be featured on the main on, on in the main magazines i don't want our art to be like separated i don't want our art to be just like couldn't you know can't take cloth shit do you know what i mean ghana must go bags no it should be spoken about the same way you speak about you know some nondescript person from fucking belgium putting a you know a wooden chair in the middle of a gallery it should be the same level it should be given the same level of respect in my personal opinion so let's just remove african and let's just call it contemporary art so she doesn't like salon she thinks it's terrible she continued with that tweet thread she continued and said while we are on the topic let's discuss why you will see thousands of minstrel style art in galleries on the left used to represent black people before you ever see art on the right by kiende wiley depicting black people as they are that's very untrue kiende wiley is one of the most popular successful very well sold black artists in the world um you know their artwork is shown everywhere so to say that you don't see this type of artwork in places is ridiculous to be completely honest but i understand what they mean in terms of maybe this striking imagery with the black skin and the big red lips maybe a lot of galleries like this because you know number one is edgy it causes controversy it gets attention um it drives clicks and at the end of the day galleries aren't there to kind of I wouldn't say galleries are there to sort of like inform the public on like new art forms or new artists. Galleries are basically a showroom for the artwork. Um, they're there to sell artwork. They're not there to kind of, you know, bolster the fucking, you know, the scene, the industry, highlight new artists at all. No, they're just a function of just selling work. So if they can get attention, if they can kind of, you know, clickbait rage bait people into visiting a fucking exhibition they'll do so so maybe that might explain why a lot of this stuff is being featured it continue and again it's just it's still just you know cherry picking examples the art world is systemically racist i also don't think this is true maybe the system when it comes to selling artwork might be systemically racist or might be um what's that word called might be very clicky but i don't think it's racist i think the racism term is a little bit you know it's a little bit extreme i think there's a ton of galleries out there that are showcasing artwork from people from all over the world from all walks of life to so to assess this racist is dumb because if it was racist then how is this girl existing i know she doesn't sell her work or display it in major art galleries but the fact that this young lady the art babe exists kind of you know dissuades that notion 
We continue. It says art that isn't clowning black features gets little to no representation. I'm sick and tired as an artist seeing that style with history behind it being the only way the art world sees black people. I feel more empowered seeing art that completely represents us in full chrome and hue compared to the art that tries to reclaim racial stereotypes. This is the art that I create. I hope to fill the world with empowering art of black women and it features some of the artwork that she puts out there, which in my opinion, I feel like it's a little bit like, you know, bit boring um although it's very realistic although it's very nice to the eye um obviously the messaging behind it is rather uplifting you see a lot of these depiction of black women in jungles and forests and around nature and shit and being this you know ba basically being depicted as a form of mother nature i just think in terms of a, a piece of artwork in terms of telling a US story in terms of taking you on a journey in terms of inspiring you whatever it may be just thinks a little bit boring in my personal opinion but what do i know but she stood on her shit which i like when people do she double triple down also tweet muted i said what i said and she also said calling me jealous when i create art that i do is crazy i could never sell my soul to appeal to racist if you're interested in my art here's the link below so she obviously has a link to all her work that she puts out some prints blah 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 well it didn't stop there she continued going after sloan right after this right she still got his foot her foot on his neck or her foot on his neck so she posted the following she said all money ain't good money my self-respect peace sanity ain't up for sale i cannot have my art in the home of an artist who sold out his community so ever since that tweet went viral which i posted which i kind of showed you already here where she was basically quote tweeting his work and saying i can't believe this guy's shitty work is getting more attention than my work this racist tropes are horrible it furthers systemic you know racist thing in art industry she then went on to continue doing that and i guess sloan saw this and he decided to buy some of her stuff right sloan thought he was doing like a drake when like when drake sent um charlemagne bottles of fucking champagne sloan thought he could do the same thing to this girl so he went and bought a bunch of her work right <laughs> as you can see the notification here you have a you have a new order for 10 items totaling 273 pound and then she saw that and decided to cancel his order <laughs> this girl hates this guy so much she cancelled all his orders for the items that he's, he tried to buy from her to kind of prove a point that you know she's a hater and that like, he's doing much better than her or whatever it may be could you imagine that could you imagine that much on both sides right like she hates him for being an artist who kind of is sold out his community and is depicting black people in a horrible way and um she i guess he hates her because she's just hating him and because he makes more money than her and he's more successful whatever it may be but i do kind of rate it i'm not gonna lie i fucking rate it so she decided to post a picture of him and took a screenshot of all these racy tweets that he put out where he kind of doesn't look that great one tweet he says sloan my baby mama is actually slavic white as hell blonde with blue eyes thank god sorry donkey kong Another tweet from him says, I'm making an app where white people can pay to call me nigger anonymously. <laughs> I think that always that already exists, boy. We've got Twitter. That already exists, my friend. Another one, he says, who's your target audience? He says, racist. Another one says, me, I got money and started doing coke with racist. So Olo saying he does coke with racist. Another one says, Nigeria is really nigger real. Another one says, ugly dad, beautiful son duo. And another tweet, what else has he got here? oh sorry and um and obviously she put the caption at the top she says also the people jumping me saying i'm jealous of this man selling his work for 30k and putting down another man's hustle this is who you're supporting so clearly she's not a fan of the guy she thinks he's horrible she thinks he's bad for the art world and she decided to stand on her shit receive his orders which they came through on her shopify and she cancelled every single one of them which is again i think you know the kind of hate levels that i kind of aspire to get to where you would turn down someone's money because you hate them that much i fucking love it so she continues in the tweet she says M um most of must have lost your damn mind if you thought i would want my art in your home knowing how racist and sick you are as an individual fumbling the bag because i don't want my art in a racist home my gosh some of you are literally have zero integrity when money is involved so again fair enough do you know what i mean she's standing on her shit she hates Ola Sloan. She doesn't want his artwork anywhere featured anywhere near her and she obviously decided to stand on her shit and cancel his order now what do i think about this whole thing i think essentially this for me is another indication of like i wouldn't even say crabs in the barrel 
I just think it's another indication of why the UK is bad vibes. Because I think, in my personal opinion, both of these people can coexist. You can have the art babe doing her thing. You can have Sloan doing his thing without their needing to interact, intersect, or put each other down. But unfortunately, because there's so little opportunities, specifically in the art world, especially if you want to go through the conventional galleries and you want all that recognition shit, right? Which I personally wouldn't want and don't give a fuck about. I think you're probably better off, you know, renting out your own space and doing a little exhibition with your own money, um, doing it obviously during the time that everyone does exhibitions, but you don't need to go through the conventional arts, art kind of system, whatever it may be. But because they want to play that game, there is a limited space there. There are limited spaces, particular people that come from a particular environment, black and brown people. So they're basically competing for that one chair on the table and around the dinner table, surrounded by a bunch of white people that want to buy their art and put a hang up in their mansion somewhere. That's the unfortunate side of the situation. Like they can't coexist because they all want that same seat at that same table because they all both know intrinsically or in instinctively deep down that once you get a seat at that table, you're basically set for life. You basically have patrons that can kind of look after you. You have galleries that will work for you until the end of time and essentially kind of all but guarantees your future because they look at you as an artist and most of these people want to surround themselves with creative people who come from, you know, backgrounds or, you know, um, lives that they probably have never lived. So they almost, in a way, fetishize you. So, you know, playing that role and being in that position can all but guarantee your safety and your future. But obviously a part of you ends up dying. Now, if we lived in a perfect world, these people could do their own thing without obviously interacting with each other and everything would be nice. But the fact that they're not and they're beefing, it kind of is what it is. I just like the fact that they're not hiding their hate for each other, right? She hates him because she thinks he's, she thinks he's, his art is shit and he definitely doesn't rate her because, you know, he thinks, yeah, you might make better artwork than me. Technically, you might be a better painter, drawer, illustrator, whatever it may be. But I figured this, way, I've, I figured this thing out. And, you know, I think most of us would know, especially the older you get, it's rarely um, a thing of talent. It's mostly about how you kind of work that thing for yourself into your advantage, especially when it comes to the arts, especially when it comes to these careers that are kind of, you know, unconventional. There is no kind of blueprint. There is no step-by-step -step guide to become a contemporary artist. You basically just figure it out. So in these type of careers, it is really less about what you know and maybe who you know maybe in that regard and obviously Sloan has kind of figured that out seeing that he's so kind of cool and in the right circles surrounded by certain people blah -de blah 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 she just needs to figure out her way of doing it it doesn't need to be his way it doesn't need to be with his circle of people she just needs to figure out her way of doing it and then it'll be fine or maybe she needs to be honest about her need for acknowledgement or recognition from the conventional art world and art industry maybe she's being a little bit you know, maybe she's kind of lying to herself that she doesn't want that recognition. And because he's been recognized there, she doesn't want to be recognized by a racist, but she clearly does want a little bit of recognition, which is perfectly fine. Just be honest with yourself and then try and figure out how you can get that recognition in some way or whatever. But I find this interesting. Um, again, you know, this fucking contemporary art beef amongst uh, black people, especially for my community and stuff, is a bit unfortunate. But I do kind of like the fact that they're wearing their hate on their chest. But unfortunately, this is another example of why the UK is such bad vibes and why it's all but difficult to kind of make and thrive your a career in the arts in the UK because people are always sniping at you. People are always asking why you should have this, why you don't have that. It's a bit of a crazy world. And then to end it, to end it, to end it, to end this situation, Look at this tweet she put out. This girl's a fucking savage. I guess this person at the bottom um, decided to say something, you know, mean to her and call her stuff mean. So this young lady decided to go into a, you know, tweets and quoted a bunch of these pictures where she's wearing these outfits and quoted and said, saying that my art is just colors and gives high school art project while dressing like a pirate's wife is extremely audacious. So the art babe is a bit of a, she's a bit, <laughs> she's a, she likes a bit of a clap back she's a bit of a meanie in her own way but i'm, I'm not gonna lie i kind of like this energy i love this energy she called this woman a she dresses like a pirate's wife <laughs> could you imagine somebody insulting your looks and saying you dress like a pirate's wife don't get me wrong there is some you know there is some credence to what she's saying with some of these outfits but jesus christ man the art babe is a fucking meanie she hates salon she hates pirates outfits
<laughs> she's just not with it she's just not with it she's just not with it so leave the art babe alone let her sell her artwork don't piss her off if you do she's gonna quit to you and destroy some of your outfits so leave that woman alone leave that blood clout woman alone if you so may please moving on from that one i was thinking just now about this tweet that i saw a while back from somebody on the old social medias regarding the lack of hangout spots for black people in the uk off the back of that slawn and obviously the beef that's happening within the you know the the higher ups in the fucking contemporary art black world here in london so i was thinking to myself you know what there is some truth to this because i will often complain on my side of nightlife i say that you know i go to a lot of techno parties a lot of oots, 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 oots raves and i often complain about feeling otherized in those spaces right because i'm not queer because i'm not lgbtq but i go to these type of events sometimes i feel like i get grouped within the cis white male kind of category of people and are kind of like you know shunned away or maybe people kind of squirm whenever you enter as opposed to me being you know maybe within the kind of you know um, specific crew of people who maybe are highlighted and protected and shit when it comes to the flint to lgbtq plus folks so it kind of is what it is but Apart from my issues, imagine how hard it must be, for lack of a better term, to be a normie black person in the UK who wants to go out somewhere to a bar and listen to some cool music and drink. There's not many places you can go to because unfortunately in the, in the UK, specifically in London, pub culture is basically a white thing. It shouldn't be a white thing because pubs, you know, from what I remember, the founding of pubs was mostly like a traveller thing. So when people were travelling throughout the UK, these pubs were basically places where people could they kind of were referred to as watering holes as well where you could basically go and refresh yourself um have something to eat have something to drink maybe even have a kip and then continue on to your travels but if there were travelers that would mean they came from all corners of the world right they came from all parts of the uk all over europe the rest of the world so most of pubs especially back in the day when they were founded were a real melting pot of people from all walks of life but for some reason, in the modern age, on the modern day, or in the 21st century, most pubs, especially here in London, are mostly whitewashed. They, you know, from their decor to their interior to the people that are in there, they're not really places where a lot of black people would feel comfortable to go into. So if you don't want to go to a pub, you don't have to go to a cocktail bar. But then cocktail bars can be a bit stuffy, they can be a bit of a dead vibe, they can be overpriced, and they're just not the most fun places to go to if you want fun you'll probably go to a pub but pubs you're not really going to feel comfortable but then if you want to feel comfortable you go to a fucking cocktail bar but they're not really going to be fun so there's no real in between which then makes me think this is probably the reason why the parties like recess and shit have become so popular because they're catering their raves and their parties specifically to the black community in the UK. Because we don't really have those parties, right? You even got the the, the club night called R and B night and shit, right? But unfortunately, these are like party promoters that do events in different venues. There's no established pub. The only one I can think of is the Prince of Peckham. There's a place called I think it's the Prince of Peckham, right? I think it's the Prince of Peckham. There's a spot called the Prince. I think somebody even might have mentioned it here somewhere in the quotes. There's a pub in Peckham. I think it's the Prince of Peckham that is quite possibly the only pub that I would assume has got a lot of black people in it. Um, black people do feel comfortable in it. All bre all manner of people feel comfortable in it. Yeah, there we go. Somebody mentions it here. The Prince of Peckham, Queen of the South, and the Haggerston and Dawson are the only places where I would imagine to see a lot of black people that would kind of enjoy their time there. So, I'm thinking to myself like, that might be something that I kind of look into kind of doing myself. And it also might be something that I think more people within the entertainment, you know, cultural, commentary, fun, podcasty type of space should look into doing. Instead of all these motherfuckers standing around or sitting around tables talking about, you know, whether or not your guy should pay for the first date or whether or not you would get flown out and all these sort of nonsense topics. Maybe one of the topics that people should kind of go around is creating some sort of space in nightlife where people that look like us can go and party have a good time people can go and perform people can go and just hang out and you know socialize and build community or maybe make some friends so that we've got like a legit place that you can go to every weekend to hang out because i was also thinking the other day when the future album dropped right when the metro boom and the future album dropped we don't trust you i was thinking to myself like if i went to go out somewhere now and hear that music loud on a system on a sound system 
and just order a ton of fucking Jaeger bombs, where could I go and listen to that short shit? Like, where could I actually go? If I went to go somewhere, I'd have to like buy a ticket to go somewhere, right? I'd have to kind of look at like, I'd have to buy a ticket. I'd have to go look through fucking RA to find the event. There's not like a bar I can just go to and hear the latest, you know, sick hip hop album that just dropped that weekend play on the weekend. It doesn't exist, um, which is a real shame. The only thing I could think of back in the day that was like that was Visions. There was this place called Visions in Dawson that kind of was that the, the place to go to if you're like a you know a black person that kind of had way to hang out but you didn't want to go to like a bait so, you know soho type of a place but then over time that place got kind of corrupted and ended up having a, bit, a bunch of madness attached to it and then it ended up kind of going under but i think that's the next evolution i suppose that's where we kind of next need to go because there's enough sick promoters there's enough sick party organizers out there. Like I said, the recesses of this ilk and a few other people out there, the R&B nights out here and a few other people who are doing sick events. I think they did one recently at Drum Sheds that was really pop, that was really, that went off really well and everyone seemed to enjoy it. There's enough people that are doing great raves. I think the next step now is to have a place, like a spot. Um, maybe it's called the spot, wherever it's fucking called, where people can go and hang out and feel comfortable and not feel like they're kind of impeding from the white man space when it comes to pubs um like i said it would it would be better if we could just co-op pubs and have those be our hangouts but they're not the closest thing i can see to that especially in the place in london that i live in is weatherspoons the weatherspoons in the hoods are usually a mix of people because they're in the hood like the one in fucking hackney that's across the road from the hackney empire that's a very kind of multicultural West weather spoons for the most part but those are the only ones but again do you really want to be hanging out in the spoons listen to fucking future i don't do you know what i mean it's way too bright in there it smells funky i'd want there's a place to be a little bit fun a little bit cooler and kind of make that work but again you know it's going to require the help and support of everybody in the community because one thing that we can also be certain for is that if you do create a space predominantly for black people um you know you're going to be inviting some ragamuffins into that space also who might end up you know done in a whole dance so it's probably going to take a lot of effort to ensure that these places don't get shut down because one thing that you know local councils and local police love to do is to kind of limit the amount of spaces that black and brown people can kind of enjoy and have fun with so the reason why i was talking about this is because of this tweet this young lady put out on social that went kind of viral on my side of the internet it's got 676 thousand fucking views on the old twitter and she said so there's really no hangout spots for black people in london unless it's an event nowhere to casual just to rock up without booking and buying a ticket exactly everything is fucking i think this is also an issue in the techno world in my kind of oots, oots, oots world, it's also an issue that all the events you go to have to require pre-booking. There's no sub, there's no such thing as spontaneity. You can't just rock up to a random place and go. You have to kind of prepare yourself. You have to kind of dress like a fucking techno ninja. You got to take your fucking ID with you. All this sort of nonsense, right? You can't just rock up somewhere, hear some good tunes and kind of dip. It doesn't exist. So let's read some of the replies of what people say here. Um honestly what does this even mean okay shut up this person's talking shit this person says all the same spots that everyone has access to i'd imagine another one says there's loads again th these aren't good options for me box park like who wants to be who wants to spend their weekend at box park really for real going to box park is the equivalent of hanging out at little i swear to god it's the, it's the bar equivalent of hanging out at little like I'm not for that in the slightest. Spoons, I I probably prefer to go to a weather spoons or go to a box park. I know that sounds insane, but I'd probably rather spend my night in the spoons than a fucking box park. Um La La some a place called La La Land. Be at one. Be at one, you know. This person has got honestly, whoever whoever this person's friends are, they need to throw this guy into the nearest fucking motorway. Be at one. <laughs> <laughs> who the fuck is going to be at one? Oh my god simmons london cocktail club o2 westfield unless you're fucking 19 why are you just going to be hanging out at westfield imagine oh my god okay this person's chatting the most. oh if i could downvote this person's tweet i would downvote it another person says here any any genuine manifestation of culture in london appear to have been eradicated and replaced with a sinister cult of local and friendly business okay i don't know what this person's talking about another one says prince of peckham queen of the south the haggerson and dawson i co-signed the haggerson and dawson i used to go there all the time back in the day i haven't been there in a long 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 time but the haggerson and dawson is probably one of the best pubs i think all around in london great vibe um you know great staff 
Um, usually they have decent nights on with DJs and shit on the weekend. Um, they have a decent kitchen as well, pop up stuff. Um, last time I went there, there was a pretty decent person doing pizzas in there and shit. D nice prices, good pints, good laughs. Um, if you're in, you know, if you're single, ready to mingle, there's usually a couple baddies in there. So it's, it's a nice little place. I'm not gonna lie. Prince of Peckham, I've never been to. Queen of South, I've also never been to. Um, so those are probably worth an option as well. Let me actually let me actually bookmark this for another time. Um, big up this person. That was a good suggestion. Another one says I've been saying this. We need pubs. Another one saying um, you say this like we don't we don't hang out and haven't been hanging out in most places. Food joints, parks, block BB. Look all look all this fucking ghetto shit. I don't want to hang out. I don't want to turn my night into a. I don't. I, sorry, I'm I'm not sure about you guys, but. I don't I don't want to turn restaurants into places to hang out. I think restaurants should be what they are. And if you want to go and have a turn up night, you can go to another place. Nowadays in London, because the events or because the spots are so terrible, restaurants have now kind of turned into quasi turn up places where most restaurants have really good cocktail menus. Most restaurants have good DJs or sound systems. Most restaurants are open quite late. So they're now turning into the new kind of late night spots. I don't think that's cool. I think we should be pushing our local governments, our local councils, our night czars, Amy fucking Lammy, you fat bitch, get yourself in order. All these people, we should be, we should, we should be pushing them into trying to fucking put back um and make a thing of having late night spots like cocktail bars and clubs reopen once again not trying to you know um crowbar um restaurants into being those new things and kind of making them an all size a one size fits all type of thing i don't want that personally another one says box park lol exactly thank you for saying that my friend another person says you'll say things like this and then play the racism card imagine white people said can we hang out okay shut up um another person says prodigy northwest thank me later it's a vibe there Okay, there's a place called Prodigy in Northwest. This looks good. This girl's smiling very hard and she's got two drinks in her hand. Anyone carrying two drinks in one place is probably a good vibe in there. Another person says, I've noticed this question marks, which I assume you mean you're looking for. Okay, shut up. Another one says, I'm not from London, but what about roller skating rinks? Imagine going to a roller skating rink over the age of 21. You must be having a laugh. Another one says, just go to a bar, rooftop bar, box. Honestly, imagine going to Box Park as a place to hang out i don't really know either way um there does need to be a change uh, most likely i will probably try to be that change as much as i would love to open up a nightclub i think being able to open up a good little spot that black people can go and hang out in or feel comfortable in that plays sick music that has you know a good system that has a good vibe that has decent drinks selection good cocktails that has the most important thing that black people would love um a wall with like foliage so everyone could take pictures or like a neon sign that says you know too lit to quit or something you know that type of shit do that and you'll fucking kill it right and i'll call it the spot or something right or call it zings zingers or something right zingers bar <laughs> and people queue up and go crazy that would be fucking amazing so maybe i need to do that and start myself instead of you know going to the white side and making my oot 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 part fucking club and trying to destroy fold maybe what i should be doing is opening up a fucking first of its kind of cool hangout black pub that is actually a vibe to go hang out in that might be the way forward that might be the way forward moving on from that one i want to talk about this so as most of you guys would know um you know kendrick and drake are going through a bit of a situation at the moment because kendrick decided to light up drake in uh, the track that features on the future metro boom new album um called like that and ever since then we've all been waiting on tender hooks for drake to reply so far nothing so in the midst of that conversation in the midst of everybody you know replaying that fucking disc record and loving the production and listening to the samples and thinking about all the times that drake has gone after other people and just kind of you know the the current discourse at the moment is who you think is going to win um rick ross has now kind of you know decided to throw his hat in the ring and be a part of the whole like anti-drake thing um you know nav unfollowed drake all this sort of stuff is happening in the background and obviously recently the most recent update has been that Drake was meant to have a feature on BFB the Pac-Man's new album, but the feature got, you know, um, didn't get approved because allegedly he's kind of putting all his efforts into dropping some sort of single that's meant to be destroying Kendrick. So with that being said, everyone's kind of talking about beef, talking about hip hop, talking about music and shit. And I guess for some reason, my guy Kanye felt a little bit excluded. He felt a little bit left out of the conversation. So out of nowhere, big up Yeezy updates, he decided to post this on Instagram story. Again, no one's talking about Kanye. 
No one's talking about Ye, no one's talking about Vultures, nothing. Everyone's talking about this this that Kendrick did on the Future album. And I guess Ye was feeling a little bit left out. So he posted this on his Instagram. Everyone knows I was Kendrick and no, on, no, on no more parties in LA. Everyone knows I watched Drake at the Free Hoover concert. Everyone knows I brought Adidas into the culture and I took them out. Everyone knows Lotta Volkova, the former stylist of um, Vetemar and Balenciaga, Demna, the creative director of Balenciaga and Vetemar founder, Virgil Abloh, Je um, obviously, you know, Virgil Abloh is um, Jerry. I'm assuming he means Jerry from Fear of God and Kim and Kim, I'm assuming he means Kim Jones, maybe, from fucking um, Dior. I'm not too sure. Um, all worked for me. I made Yeezus, Dark Fantasy, Pablo, Graduation, Throne, 808s. I made Runaway, Devil in a New Dress, Father Stretched My Hand. I'm the only person to come back to number one after cancellation. There's only one go. I stand with me. My friends call me yay. Smiley face. As true as this whole thing is, as correct as he is with every fucking single line, especially this part here, because I think a lot of people don't really talk about this much, but that free Larry Hoover concert where Drake and Ye, you know, for a very brief time decided to kind of make amends, Ye was incredible. He performed incredibly well. It almost felt like he was trying to remind Drake of the levels when it comes to performing because he was he put on an amazing show and you clearly saw the difference in terms of the levels of performance when it comes to putting on a live show so I'm glad he kind of mentioned that free Larry Hoover concert and how great he was when he did it but as much as I love Ye as much as I'm a Ye apologist as much as I love everything that he does this also feels a little bit like a little bit babyish, a little bit complainish, a little bit, a little bit of like, oh, there's no attention on me. I don't feel like people are paying attention on, about me or my album anymore. Um, whatever. I'm not in a current conversation. I want to be a part of it. So let me include myself into it by just jumping in and saying any sort of nonsense because no one's really been talking about him. And the funny thing about this is that he wants to have it all. And I think most artists are like that. Most artists are quite greedy or quite selfish. Because the truth of the matter is, Ye is a much better artist than Drake, than Kendrick and J. Cole. He's probably a better artist than all three of them combined. They could never do what he does. But unfortunately, as a quote-unquote rapper, he can't touch none of these guys, ever. It's never going to happen. Back-to-back -back this record, he'd lose all the time. Um, you know, Kendrick, sorry, Ye's strength isn't in bars. It's mostly in artistry, being able to say things on records, being able to construct certain songs, you know, elicit certain emotions, tell certain stories. But his strength isn't in lyricism. It never has been, especially nowadays where he hasn't really got the writers he used to in the past when he wasn't doing it. Because I feel like Ye lost a lot of the great writers he was kind of with maybe the Ryan Fest and a few other people who basically helped him to ghostwrite for him when he did the whole, the whole anti-Semitic thing when he started to become a Trump apologist people kind of fell off and kind of stopped supporting him and helping him out so I think nowadays my personal opinion again being a Ye fanboy I think nowadays you are getting a far better or far more true representation of Ye's lyrical ability now because he doesn't have as much help as he is in the past so if that's the case and you know a lot of people have said some of the bars in Vultures aren't the greatest. Some people have, you know, even questioned the bars on Donda, um, whatever it may be. For him to come out here and, and basically throw his hat in the ring in a conversation is silly. Because if Drake is going to struggle against Kendrick, how would fucking Ye do against Kendrick? I think Kendrick would fucking destroy him. So I don't think that's a smart decision. I think it just feels like he feels like he's a bit, you know, not included in the conversation. He went to get himself included. He started screaming about it. And now here we are. Ye is reminding everybody that he's the most important person in culture. The only one people should care about. It's fucking hilarious. You got to love Ye. You have to love Ye, but he has to chill out. He has to bloody, bloody chill out. And again, what do I know? What do I bloody know? Absolutely nothing. So on top of that, I also want to mention this. It looks like the Yes Jules and Ye back and forth isn't going to end anytime soon. Um, I'm still perturbed as to why Yes Jules seems to not want to just give this up and let it go. She got fired. I get it. It was embarrassing. It was done publicly. Maybe some of the reasons behind it were, um, you know, skewed to kind of make Ye look better and make her look worse. Who knows? But I feel like she's dragging it a bit. I feel like she just needs to kind of let it go and deal with it in the courts and not try to deal with it in the court of public opinion because, you know, it doesn't really impact us. It doesn't really bother us in the slightest. And if anything, this is probably going to end up hurting her the more she speaks about it in the public. You'd imagine if it does go to court. But regardless, she's doing anyway. So 
yes, Jules decided to jump on social media and tweet the following when somebody said at the bottom here, yeah, yes, Jules really took this line for to heart. So yes, Jules tweeted that to tweeted quoted that actual tweet that somebody posted and said the following. This that I never actually signed the NDA level of claim, as Milo clearly stated in my termination. I was then sent an NDA two days later after my fuck the NDA comment with a signature that is very clearly not mine. By the time I'm done with my legal filings, someone will be in jail. So yes, Jules is threatening to throw somebody in jail from Team Yeezy because she's alleging somebody on that side of the team forged her signature on the NDA. So it's getting kind of spicy. Um, Summers will be in jail as forging a signature is a federal crime punishable by up to 10 years in prison in the state of California. I love that she probably Googled that as well, right? She's probably sitting there Googling all these type of things, really fucking irate. So she's clearly pissed off again. Maybe there's something going on behind the scenes that we don't know. Maybe there's other things that's transpired, but she seems to be really upset about this firing. And again, maybe it's not the firing. Maybe it's the Milo thing. I don't really know, but I think she should just deal with this in the courts and not deal with this in public. But again, what do I know? Amongst other charges that are on the way, Happy Good Friday. And obviously you see here a copy. Um, I guess on the left is a picture of her ID with her actual signature. And on the right, you got a picture of what somebody signed on her behalf. So clearly they're not the same thing. Um, maybe not the smartest idea to show people your signature online. Maybe, I don't really know. But regardless, she's showing people her signature and saying that's not me. She continued raging off the back of this and going and, you know, and not having it and go, basically clapping back at anybody that kind of, you know, spun the narrative against her. There's some other tweets here as well. Another one says, so you're basically saying Milo did Diddy, did Diddy to you. And she said the following. I got the metadata on the document. I have voice notes of our calls. I've got screenshots of his racist slurs, sexual harassment. Milo was trying to fuck his jewels. That's crazy. Isn't he meant to be gay? Milo's meant to be gay and he's meant to be gay and into black guys, allegedly. So if Milo was trying to fuck yes, Jules, that is a very interesting turn of events. Um, uh, you name me, I keep all my receipts. Again, should you be saying this in public? It makes you seem like you're always building a case just in case someone fires you. It's almost like a threat kind of but again i could be wrong she says like i said i dare somebody to try and take food from my daughter's plate they have 15 days to drop the silly little claims before my counter suit is filed this i state this publicly because i was fired publicly this is the game they want to play i'm ready to play it so i guess she's saying that that lawsuit that screenshot that we saw where they were accused where they basically accused her of breaking her nda and that she has to pay a, a crazy amount of millions i think it was like seven or eight She's saying, hey, if you don't drop that, I'm going to counter suit and things are going to get ugly. But again, I'm not too sure if they even filed that lawsuit. Maybe she, they did, and that's why she's reacting, because it came through. But I don't know. It feels like she's making more out of this than what it is. And, and it might end up biting her in the ass. Another tweet she put out. Not to mention there are a lot of people awaiting packages in the mail. Okay, this is now the spicy shit because this refers to Yeezy. And I'm one of the people waiting because I ordered quite a bunch of shit from Yeezy.com um, during the whole $20 sale thing, which is still going on at the moment. And um, it hasn't come. No, you know, I've got no indication of when it's being shipped. I've got no Yeezy pods. I've got no t-shirts. I've got no sweatpants. I've got a fucking nothing. Diddly squat. So a bit annoyed, but hey, I guess it is what it is when you buy artist merch. Um, the tweet she puts out as follows. Not to mention there are a lot of people waiting packages in the mail based upon a four week turnaround promise on a website for a company that knew that they would be able to, they knew that wouldn't be able to deliver the product in time. Milo's words. Pretty sure all those customers have the right to file a suit on their own should they wish wow she's basically telling the fans hey file a lawsuit please file a lawsuit but hey no need to start a class action lawsuit i prefer to go the peaceful route pay me the money i'm owed for my work completed plus damages for slander and forging my signature and everything can be water under the bridge so it's almost like she's hinting at the fans to file a class action lawsuit to get their stuff which they won't do yay fans are loyal to the core um, they would never ever file a lawsuit against Ye to get some twenty dollar merch. It will likely will get you know sent soon, but it seems like again from reading between the lines of what Yes Jules has been saying on Twitter Spaces in the past when she was working at Yeezy, there is no one at Team Yeezy that's in charge of basically making sure the orders get to the customers. It's just from what I've been reading or hearing, it's a team that designs it. It gets sent to the production company or whatever warehouse to go make it and then that's it but there is no person in between 
um, maybe it's an operations person, maybe it's a liaison, whoever that person is, they don't exist. Um, and that's basically it. We just have to kind of work it out. So I wonder if they've even got a customer service team. Probably not. Because again, I've received absolutely nothing. And again, big up, uh, who's that? Um, on the chat as well. Still waiting as well. So yeah, I'm not doing any person. There's a bunch of people out there who are waiting. Um, I think I bought like, I didn't buy that many stuff. I think I might have bought like $160 worth of stuff. Do you know what I mean? So it's not a lot. Don't get me wrong. It's not like I spent like a grand, but I still would like to have my sweatpants. You know, I'd love to represent for vultures, you know, why not? But I don't have it at the moment. She tweeted again and says, um, Okay, tell Milo to leak the timestamps and the DocuSign certificate since he loves to leak everything. Tell him we know about the blackmail he's been hanging out. What? The, that blackmail he's been hanging on to call the vault. Also, we're going to catch his ass. Everything happens for a reason. I'm glad that this happened to me so I could be the one to blow the lid off this bullshit. So I guess, yes, Jules and Milo have this ongoing beef, which I would love to know what the origins of this beef are. It seems that like they don't get along at all. They completely hate each other um because it seems like milo was the one that said all the catty shit about you know yes jewels on Ye's instagram but obviously he didn't clarify i feel like it kind of sounded like something milo would say about oh, of course you've been fired but i wonder what the beef was between them i wonder what kind of started the beef between yes jewels and milo i wonder um i ain't said shit yet believe that Another tweet says, Trashy would have been giving the excuses to TMZ the day I was wrongfully terminated in front of 20 million people. I've been quite the class act through this whole process, if you ask me. My patience is running thin, though. Another one, she says, solely because of my affinity for yay and loyalty. Another one, what is she saying here? Um, honey, the check what? So somebody said to her, why did you save all of this for after? Um, you got fired like I'm sorry if that happened to you but you're a grown woman and mum you shouldn't have enabled that kind of behavior just for a check when you know you can always get another job it's giving clout chasey respectfully she said um it wasn't for money it wasn't for money for me it never was he knows that oh no sorry the, the, the top honey the check was peanuts I make more on snapchat in a week um, then the, what I was made at a company in a month of working overtime and holidays. I was It wasn't the money for me. It was never that. Ye knows that. His team knows that. And that's why they wanted me up out of there. These people were leeches who can't get hired anywhere. That's a weird thing to say, isn't it? Why would they fire you if they know that you are there for more than money? If you're that passionate that you would work overtime and on holidays and you really love Ye, you love Yeezy, you want to spread the message, you want to get the shit everywhere, you want to help in any way you can, why would they fire you? Because you're so good at what you do. That doesn't really make any sense, does it? Hmm. Maybe I'm missing something. I wanted to help my favorite artist go back to making the world a better place. I see him continue to surround himself with bloodsuckers and always think I can come in and change things. Um, but sometimes my little bit of light isn't enough to illuminate a spade for um, a space filled with dark, such darkness. Me getting fired was a blessing. Them suing me will be their biggest mistake. Again, I'm not too sure. I mean, it seems like she thinks she's the light and everyone else is the darkness. Maybe they're, they're all in the darkness. Maybe Ye wants these bloodsuckers around him. Maybe he doesn't want people with clear minds, rational thinking around him. Maybe that's part of the issue. Who knows? Um, another one, she says, it must have something to do with the skill. Wonder what something could be. It's death that to go. Another one says, um, the damn best thing they did was firing you because this is how you act. Even the new artists you will work with will know you are going to run for the press after something happens. So let's see what she replied there. She says, running to the press would have been me saying yes to any of these interview requests. There's plenty more where these came from. I come here to speak my piece because I care only for my truth to be known amongst my personal supporters and audience, not for the clout or the additional eyeballs. And to be frank, I don't ever have to work with another artist ever again, should I choose not to. So she's basically saying, don't play with me. I make a bunch of money. I'm paid. I'm fucking rich. I don't need artists. Artists need me. Fair enough. All I ever have done is give people all my all and only be undervalued and underpaid. To be fair, if this keeps happening to you, you kind of have to look in the mirror. You, you know, you can't always be the perfect person and you always can't be the perfect victim. If this keeps on happening to you and you keep getting undervalued and overlooked, maybe or underpaid, maybe there's something you're not doing. You, maybe there's something that you're doing that's putting you in that situation continually. You, you'd think so. But again, I could be wrong. So um, she then decided to include um, some 
screenshots from her email that shows various different publications reaching out to her for you know insights and for more information regarding her getting fired from Yeezy so she's turning down all these requests and deciding instead to see, say her piece on social media now this could be looked at as an honorable thing to do but it also could be looked at from my point of view just to be cynical that maybe she's running away from actually having to answer some tough questions from journalists who might ask follow-up questions who might want specific clarifications as opposed to just talking like in a one-way term, you know, on her fucking social media feed. Maybe that's the way. Maybe. Who knows? But, you know, maybe she'd be giving some ratings for not going to the big publications and kind of airing out all the dirty laundry in there. Maybe. It continues here. Um, someone says, yes, when they booted you from the team in December 2022, he went off and told National File that Ye propositioned him for sex, told his telegram that Ye had a non hetero relay liaison and wrote the RNC disavowing Ye. What? So this person saying Milo said this. Did Milo say he had sex with Ye? When he was, oh, yeah, true. Milo was sacked from Ye in 2022, isn't it? True. I think he was sacked from them a couple of times. But now he's chief of staff. He went off and told National File that Ye propositioned him for sex. Fucking no. Can you imagine Ye fucking Milo? Not really. But hey, I can imagine probably fucking Luca or something. Luca Sabat. But I couldn't imagine seeing him fucking Milo. <laughs> he doesn't have enough ass. Anyway, continue. Milo has stolen from and blackmailed Ye, and this is a known fact. Wow. It baffled me that he's still around until I received a phone call explaining why after my whole situation went public. It's not rocket science. So why is he why is he still around then? Could she explain to us? Because I'm I'm confused. Is Ye scared of Milo Yiannopoulos? I wonder why he's still around. Someone needs to explain that to me clearly. Another person says here. I mean, if what she says is true, one, she never signed the NDA. Two, they have forged her signature to pretend she signed it. There's absolutely no way they can enforce a fake NDA. And signature forging is actually a way more serious crime than just tweeting info about a company. Another one says, what do you recommend? Yes, Jules, cancel my order or wait for them to ship it. She says, LOL, good luck, brother. <laughs> this ain't good, man. We ain't going to get our sweatpants, are we, guys? Guys and girls, we're not going to get our sweatpants. Yes, Jules says to somebody, LOL, good luck, brother. And she was in there. She was in Team Yeezy. She was in the factory. She was talking to that fucking Dove Cherney, Dove Carney guy, right? The former American Apparel guy who does Los Angeles Apparel with the people that produce all the Yeezy stuff. So if she's saying, LOL, good luck, brother, it's not looking good for us. It's not looking good for us. Another one. Someone says, hell, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. She says, like a single mother who's been bullied, harassed, abandoned in a foreign country against her will, wrongfully terminated, docked, stifled of payment and so on. Absolutely not. This fury is different. She's going for it. Another person says, right, but Milo was the one who brought it to the social first, true? So now she has a right to defend her name and brand in the same way. I followed Jules for the better part of a decade. She's pretty meticulous. I imagine we've only seen 10% of what she's have been, uh, may have for the countersuit, LOL. So this guy is clearly, clearly trying to fuck. Fair play. Another one says, um, by the way, I reached out to every mutual friend I could think of, urging them to have Kanye call me so I wouldn't have to move forward with my countersuit. I assume everyone is too pussy to address him about this. So this is my last attempt before I take action. I gave everyone over a week to do the right thing and fire this pedo, pay me for my completed work and drop the nonsense intent to arbitrate. Even asked everyone in a text if this was real because the way Milo wrote it was so damn laughable brackets my name is misspelled mozart is reference and the pot calling the kettle black with reference of outbursts and hateful behavior was just a cherry on top for me i had to assume this was fake but nope it was real so my response to this will be very real also by the way milo le leaked this through kanye defense team and kanye's post first i have receipts for that too since they don't give pedophile social media <laughs> <laughs> big up yes jules calling milo a pedo is fucking crazy oh yeah true didn't he no is she calling him a my is she calling milo a pedo because of the things he said that got him cancelled didn't milo say something like all gay guys like to like you know all all gay guys like to lose their virginity with like older dudes is not what he said that got him cancelled i wonder why she's calling him a pedo is he a pedo i think he said he's hooked up with loads of dudes when he was super young underage but i don't think yeah if if you if you're a guy and you willingly fuck loads of older dudes when you're underage does that make you a pedo or does that make them a pedo i'm assuming that they're pedos you're not a pedo 
right? If you give, if you willingly give up your pussy to some older dude, yes, it's sick. Yes, it's probably not the greatest thing to do. But if you do it willingly, consent with some sort of consent, then you, you might you might be a bit of a sicko. But are you a pedo? I don't know. Who knows? Let's not get into the fucking um, pedo logistics. Uh, let's see here. So I'm gonna repost this as well. She posted some screenshots that feature what? What do these screenshots feature? What do we have here in these screenshots? Because these details are super important to kind of check out for the Yay History books. So in this screenshot, we've got a, a, an iMessage that features a PDF attachment in Confidante et al. Goddard notice of um, intent to arbitrate. Um, she says in the group, someone please confirm if this is real so I know how to move forward. As you are aware, thanks to Milo leaking my private information, I'm receiving a number of questionable emails from Yeezy employees and need to validate this text message since emails have been compromised. Someone says, if 305 is Jules, then yes, this is very real. You have an email from me serving you with notice over the weekend. You should take this very seriously and have your attorney contact me. Copy. I will most certainly handle this. So somebody called Greg the lawyer, Ye's lawyer, is telling her that, yeah, this is legit. So it's probably coming from Ye too. I guess maybe Yes Jules is just in denial. Maybe she thinks that Ye couldn't have co-signed this, but it sounds like Ye is co-signing this. Um, yeah, exactly. Look at Josie in the screen chat. Josie, big up Josie. Older gay men will hook up with and show youngins away. Yeah, so it's a thing. So why did why did Milo get cancelled for saying something that a lot of gay guys actually know to be true? Or is it the way that he said it? I don't I still don't understand. Maybe he didn't get cancelled for that, but I remember that being quite a big deal at the time because he admitted that he hooked up with loads of older dudes when he was underage. I don't know. Weird. But anyway, regardless. Um we've got a copy of the notice to intend to arbitrate with obviously the crazy seven million dollar no eight million dollar fucking fine or whatever she has to pay absolutely wild so i guess it's legit it has been filed and it's actually legit and obviously you can see the the name of greg k nelson who i assume is yay's lawyer also so it's looking very real so i guess she's gonna have to try to work this out some way or the other um we continue on any more tweets from her before we finish this it says if you have a, if if you've been waiting for your order longer than four weeks and like to take action, email me. Wow, she's now putting together a class action lawsuit against Yay for the, you know, unshipped for the ship. The orders haven't been shipped yet. Have a great weekend, everyone. Another one says, I really don't want to do this. My problem lies with Milo, but I can't ignore the rest of the team, including the founder of the company, has been complicit. I have no choice but to fight back. Fair play to her. Email the receipts to work at yesjewels.com. Another one says, at his loss, I don't care to, about, to be around. I need money, my money, and my name cleared. Another, I, I, I thought you said you make more money on Snapchat in a week. Why are you so impressed about the money you get from music? But maybe it's just the principle of it. Another one, she says, it's coming. These tweets are my last attempt to spare Ye of more legal woes than he already has. Um, another one she says that company tried to intimidate the wrong girl with a bogus ass lawsuit that's what happened I'm not the first employee dealing with this bullshit I'm just the first one to speak up and fight back thanks for the reminder someone says I always wonder why there's World Cup lawsuit for the STEM player oh yeah true the STEM player those that bought were promised an album and received an unfinished rushed album with no attempt to finish it pure cash grab seems to be the common thread here or the easy two, two, two months ago exactly I, I still haven't got mine no easy pods, no sweats, no t-shirts. Yay. Another one. She's got no more. She's got more fucking DMs. Yo, this girl is fucking letting it thick in it. Yes, she was not having it. Another tweet. If I didn't care, I wouldn't have offered my team to personally aid the LA warehouse with shipping out the merch. I'm in marketing. That's not my job, but I was willing to do it. I was urging for exchanges to be made available for customers since there were so many sizing issues and we are in a recession. Please wake up and understand I'm not the bad guy here. So there's more tweets, more fucking IMs, more IM, more I messages that she's sharing here. One directly with the Dov Charney, who's obviously the founder of Los Angeles Apparel, who's manufacturing and produ or producing and manufacturing a lot of the Yeezy stuff. Um, the, t the email or the text message says as follows. I think we've allowed for some exchanges. I agree with exchanges. It's not an issue. Then Yes Jules replies to her and says, let me know when we can. I can help your team with main power for the mine if needed. She's, he says no manpower needed. He has to authorize it and we will change it up. She says he seems to think we don't have to manpower. He says we have the manpower. I have a whole group. Maybe write him that we can accept exchanges when you feel he's in a correct mood. 
oh, imagine having to work. I love Ye, but imagine having to work with him day to day. You have to fucking walk on eggshells, propose things to him when he only is in the right mood. Like it must be hell to work with him, isn't it? As inspiring and motivating and as illuminating and amazing as it must be to be in his presence, to also work with him day to day as a human must be slightly exhausting. Another I message, she says, I feel we should offer exchanges. Perhaps we can donate the ones that get exchanged to homeless. At current price point, it's a gamble to buy with no returns or exchanges when unsure of sizes. So clearly she was trying to do the right thing. Again, these are all cherry picked though. You know, she's cropped a few of them and picked the ones that make her look good. So maybe there's another narrative running. So you have to kind of, you know, always read these things with a pinch of salt. Maybe it's not the whole entire truth, but it is looking like the Yeezy team is a bit of a mess behind the scenes, man. Shouldn't be surprising though, right? We shouldn't be too surprised, but I'm a bit pissed because, you know, I spent $160 on some Yeezy stuff and I'm probably never going to get it. <laughs> That's the thing. Jules is right, to be honest. And the person says, I'm done for today. Toodles. So um, I'm leaving out details in Ye's favor. I show messages because my point is solely to do away with it. My purpose is sharing text is to show my intentions and protect my name um, as anyone else is being attacked in a way that I've been would eventually do. I'm here not to slander anyone. I'm just defending myself. So yeah, big up Yes Jules, I guess. She's defending herself. She has been probably unfairly slandered on socials. A lot of it, I think she's kind of brought on herself because she just want, doesn't want to let this issue go and deal with it privately um, with lawyers and representatives. She seems like she wants to correct her name in the court of public opinion. But to be fair, considering her work, considering where she, considering the area that she works in in marketing, considering her brand is basically her, it does make a lot of sense why she's fighting tooth and nail to clear her name because she doesn't want people to think of her in a certain way. So maybe it's, maybe it, that explains why she's fighting so hard to make sure people know the truth. But in all, I think this probably isn't going to end well for anyone in this situation. That's the unfair solution with this situation. But hey, what can we do? What can we do? Peace and light to everybody involved and hopefully it works out. I guess the only thing to kind of see now going forward is that if you're a kid and you want to get involved with Yeezy, I think forget trying to get involved with Kanye or Ye and everybody else in a creative sense. I think if you really want to make a mark and you really want to change things or you really want to be indispensable or you really want to be a linchpin of Yeezy team, you probably should come in with some logistics, um, you know, um, import, export, admin, um, all of that sort of boring stuff, non-creative stuff experience. You'll probably end up having a job for life if you were the person that was just that just got shit done you got packages sent out you dealt with returns um you know logistical you know stuff manufacturer like you just you just were on that sort of stuff and you were the one-stop shop for all that shit you would probably have a job for life at team easy apart from trying to be the kind of creative person i think that's probably the way to do it but you would also have to deal with yay you'd have to deal with yay You'd have to be, you have to basically be between Ye and Dov Shani, who I'm assuming is probably just as much of a nightmare to deal with. So you have to deal with all those egos. Um, you know, you'd have probably have to deal with another version of a Yes Jules there who's also trying to make the name for himself. So it's not going to be an easy job, but if you do want to get involved, that probably is a good way to get involved. If you want to kind of intern for Ye, forget trying to produce for him or make, you know, album covers. He's got enough excellent creative people, stylists that can work for him and do a good job doing admin stuff for Yeezy probably is the right way to get in there but again would you be able to bear it day to day working with Ye would you have to bear it that's the real fucking question but hey what can you do what can you do anyway that has been the Agassino Zynga show episode number 759 it's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual if you've enjoyed the show you like what you've seen you see what you like and you're watching via the live stream please make sure that you leave me or smash the flipping like button down below if you're listening to this via the audio podcast whether you're listening on apple whether you're listening on spotify or any other platform please could you leave me a five-star review on that platform that'd be greatly appreciated also and of course um if you want to contact me or you want to check out some of my stuff that i do please feel free to check out the links in my description down below that would also be greatly appreciated big up richie appreciate you big up richie big up richie, big up, richie. i purchased yeezy stuff in february i'm still waiting for product also but i think i'll get my yeezy stuff before we see those balenciaga flats <laughs> but hey what do i know what do i know no 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 you know you know you you won't you'll see those balenciaga flats before you i bet you you see the balenciaga flats before you get your yeezys no, actually, well, I'm not going to bet you, but I know I will because I've got the Blanchard Flats in my position. I don't have these in my position. So you'll see the Blanchard Flats before that. I promise you, Richie. Trust me, you'll see them. 
But yeah, you're not going to get the fucking easy stuff at all. No no time soon. I, I know that's not going to happen. But hey, what can we do? What can we do? Um, How much do you say you spent? You just say you, spent, you bought in February. Again, I, I think I spent like 160. I think, I, think, I think that's why. I think so. 160, 120. So maybe six or so items. So yeah, um, let's see when it drops. But anyway, regardless, thank you, Richie. I appreciate you for the donation, brother. Um, I'm going to jet now and set up the fucking random show. Thank you for tuning in, people. I appreciate all of you. Um, Please make sure you check out all my links. Um, smash the like button. Leave me a review. Contact me if you want to contact me. Um, you can reach out via the main website, which is www.diagosinozingashow.com, all one word. And you've got there's a contact me button right there at the top left-hand corner. I'm going to show you actually here on the screen. That's the Diagosino Zinga Show main podcast channel or main podcast website, sorry, where you can find all the links to so Spotify, Apple, whatever shit. And there's a contact button here at the right. So if you want to contact me regarding anything, make sure you do that. Make sure you do that. Anyway, it's been a blast. It's been a heavy time. Thank you for tuning in. Tune of the day is going to be playing underneath my voice. You're listening to the audio side of the podcast. If you're watching via the video, you'll fade to black. And the rest of you, I'll see you guys later for the random show. Take care. Be well, everybody. Peace.